Hey babe, and anybody else watching, and welcome back to A Life Together. And happy Easter. He is risen, he is risen indeed. So if you remember, um, we were looking at Ruth and that love story there. I mean, what a uh, awesome, awesome story to read around the time of Easter. So very, very cool, incredibly applicable. Uh, love it. So we looked at that yesterday um, and then saw the provision that God gave to uh, Ruth and Naomi through Boaz. And uh, yeah, again, just such an awesome, awesome thing to read, especially right now. So uh, today we are going to be looking at this transition um, to Eli and Samuel, or almost rather from Eli. Uh, but the birth and dedication of Samuel specifically is what we're looking at today. Uh, we're going to look at uh, Hannah's prayer, uh, Eli and his wicked sons, uh, the prophecies against them, incredibly important, and then also God's calling of Samuel. So that's going to put us in just these first three chapters, 1 Samuel 1, 2, and 3. So, 1 Samuel 1. There was a certain man from Ramathiam, a Zuphite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuph, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah, and the other, Penanua. And Penanua had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, where the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife, Penaniah, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion, because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. And because the Lord had closed her womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her until she wept and would not eat. Elkanah, her husband, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you so downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Once, when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on a chair by the doorpost of the Lord's temple. In bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord. And she made a vow, saying, O Lord Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, but her lips were moving. But her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, How long will you keep on getting drunk? Get rid of your wine. Not so, my lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked for of him. She said, May your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went on her way, ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning they rose and worshipped before the Lord. And then they went back to their home in Ramah. Elkanah lay with Hananiah, his wife, with Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, Because I asked the Lord for him. When the man Elkanah went up with all his family to offer the annual sacrifice to the Lord and to fulfill his vow, Hannah did not go. She said to her husband, After the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord, and he will live there always. Do what seems best to you, Elkanah, her husband, told her. Stay here until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord make good his word. So the woman stayed at home and nursed her son until she had weaned him. <coughs> Excuse me. After he was weaned, she took the boy with her, young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. When they had slaughtered the bull, they brought the boy to Eli, and she said to him, As surely as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked for him. So now I give him to the Lord, for his whole life he will be given over to the Lord." And he worshipped the Lord there. Chapter 2. Then Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord, and the Lord my horn is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. 
Do not keep talking so proudly or let your mouth speak such arrogance, for the Lord is a God who knows, and by him deeds are weighed. The bows of the warriors are broken, but those who stumbled are armed with strength. Those who were full hire themselves out for food, but those who were hungry hunger no more. She who is barren has borne seven children, but he who has many sons pines away. The Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and raises up. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. He raises the poor from the dead and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes and has them inherit a throne of honor. For the foundations of the earth are the Lord's. Upon them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his saints, but the wicked will be silenced in darkness. It is not by strength that one prevails. Those who oppose the Lord will be shattered. He will thunder against them from heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Then Elkanah went home to Ramah, but the boy ministered before the Lord under Eli the priest. Eli's sons were wicked men. They had no regard for the Lord. Now, it was the practice of the priests with the people that whenever anyone offered a sacrifice, and while the meat was being boiled, the servant of the priest would come with a three-pronged fork in his hand. He would plunge it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot, and the priest would take for himself whatever the fork brought up. This is how they treated all the Israelites who came to Shiloh. But even before the fat was burned, the servant of the priest would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, Give the priest some of the meat to roast. He won't accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. If the man said to him, let the fat be burned up first, then let him, ta let him take whatever he wants. The servant would then answer, no, hand it over now. If you don't, I'll take it by force. This sin of the young men was very great in the Lord's sight, for they were treating the Lord's offering with contempt. But Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen ephod. Each year his mother made him a little robe and took it to him, and she went up with her husband to offer the annual sacrifice. Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife, saying, May the Lord give you children by this woman to take the place of the one she prayed for and gave to the Lord. Then they would go home. And the Lord whoops, and the Lord was gracious to Hannah. She conceived and gave birth to three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. Now Eli, who was very old, heard about everything his sons were doing to all Israel and how they slept with the women who served at the entrance to the tent of meeting. So he said to them, why do you do such things? I hear from all the people about these wicked deeds of yours. No, my sons, it is not a good report I hear from them spreading the Lord's people. If a man sins against another man, God may mediate for him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who will intercede for him? His sons, however, did not listen to their father's rebuke for it was the Lord's will to put them to death. And the boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and with men. Now, a man of God came to Eli and said to him, This is what the Lord says. Did I not clearly reveal myself to your father's house when they were in Egypt under Pharaoh? I chose, chose your father out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to go up to my altar, to burn incense, and to wear an ephod in my presence. I also gave your father's house all the offerings made with fire by the Israelites. Why do you scorn my sacrifice and offer what an and offering that I prescribed for my dwelling? Why do you honor your sons more than me by fattening yourselves on the choice parts of every offering made by my people Israel? Therefore, I, the Lord, the God of Israel, d declares, I promise that your house and your father's house would minister before me forever. But now the Lord declares, far be it from me. Those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me, I will disdain. The time is coming when I will cut short your strength and the strength of your father's house so that there not, will not be an old man in your family line and you will see distress in my dwelling. Although good will be done to Israel in your family line, there will never be an old man. Every one of you that I do not cut off from your altar will be spared only to blind your eyes with tears and to grieve your heart and all your descendants will die in the prime of their life. And what happens to your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, will be assigned to you. They will both die on the same day. I will raise up for myself a faithful priest, who will do according to what is in my heart and mind. I will firmly establish his house, and he will minister before my anointed one, always. Then everyone left in your family line will come and bow down before him, and a piece of silver and a crust of bread and plead, 
appoint me to some priestly office so I can have food to eat. Chapter 3 The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple and the Lord, or the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So he went and laid down. Again, the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now, Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord said to Samuel a third time, and Samuel, or called Samuel a third time, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood there calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, see, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears it tingle. At that time, I will carry out against Eli everything that I spoke against his family from beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons made themselves contemptible, and he failed to restrain them. Therefore, I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. Samuel lay down until morning and then opened the doors of the house of the Lord. He was afraid to tell Eli the vision, but Eli called him and said, Samuel, my son. Samuel answered, Here I am. What was it that was said to you? Eli asked. Do not hide it from me. May God deal with you, be it ever so severely, if you hide from me anything he has told you. So Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. Then Eli said, He is the Lord. Let him do what seems good in his eyes. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and let none of his words fell to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord continued to appear at Shiloh. And there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. I think that's incredibly sobering. I mean, again, we, we see a leader. I say again, I mean, we haven't really run into it yet. But we see this great leader, this godly man, who lets his family slide. And I mean, we'll see that later on, spoiler alert, for, for King David as well, this, this seemingly great man of God. And he is a man after God's own heart, but there are failures in there. And we see that with, with Eli and his sons as well. He's neglecting to correct them. And, and he, he confronts them, but doesn't follow up on it. At least that's what it looks like. Um, but I, I wrote down here, do we... Do we recognize God's provision for our lives or do we count our possessions as ours or as our own? And the reason I brought that up is because, I mean, I think about all the stuff that God provided for Eli and for his sons. I mean, namely their food provisions, right? Their daily food provisions, how they have that fork and they're supposed to plunge it into the bowl and whatever comes out is theirs. So that could be a really big piece. That could be a really small piece. But Eli's sons are circumventing that. They're going around that to get um, the pre-cooked meat so uh, they could have their best choice of meat and they would choose it and not relying on the Lord, but actually taking from the Lord. And I think that's something that they just counted as their own, being selfish. And that got me obviously thinking about, you know, what do I, what do I count as my own? When I look, when I look at certain objects in my house, do I or in this house, do I assume they're mine? When I look at the house itself, do do I assume that, hey, my hands have have brought this home to me? Well, I better not. And anytime I do, I, I really try and repent of that quickly. Because, I mean, that's something that even God has given me the ability to hold the job that I have. He's given me the job, number one, but then he's also given me the mental ability to to do that job. So I think that's something that is so, so important to recognize God's provision and recognize that that is 
God's still. He's allowed us to be temporary stewards of it. I mean, I think about that, that ties into the tithe too, right? That 10% is, all of this is God's anyway. What are you willing to say that you're giving back to God what is truly already his? I mean, he owns everything on this earth anyway. Everything was made through the word of Jesus. So, some worth praying about. So let's do it. God, we thank you for this Easter. We thank you that it all centers around Jesus's obedience, his death, and God, absolutely his resurrection. You have given us so much in that inheritance, in this incredible, beautiful inheritance, God, and we thank you so much for it. Lord, let us claim that as our provision, as our portion, Lord, that we don't get tied up on the things of this world. Lord, be gracious with us, with us when we forget that, but also help us to recognize that what we have is your son, and that is infinitely more than we could ever need. We thank you so, so much for him. Jesus, I thank you for living that life that we can absolutely not and for living that to the point of death, and for that beautiful resurrection. In your son's name we pray. Amen. And that is about all I have for you today. Again, happy Easter. Know that I appreciate you tons. And wife, appreciate you as well. I will plan on seeing you tomorrow. Have a good one.